One of the things that's just not changing fast enough is this, what I call the stuck record group. And this is, the, for example, the dysfunctional triangle in South Africa between government, business, and labor. And we have, at the, at the moment, we have an extraordinary mistrust between business and government. And I actually think a lot of that's our fault as business, because we adopt an arrogant, we'll show you how to do it approach instead of let's engage and work it out together approach. So we need to cross some of those bridges. If you look at the political divides that now manifest between where the government came from, which was the labor movement, and where the government is now versus the labor movement, you start wondering whether that will become functional again. And you start looking at some of the obsolete economic equations that are the blunt instruments of negotiation between labor and business. So, for example, in the mining world, you cannot possibly have a linear economic equation with your laborers when you have a <clears throat> completely mixed up equation about your fortunes, which are determined by exogenous variables. So, you can't say we want a 7% increase when the gold price is halved, if you're in a gold mine. You have to find some sort of participative economic accord between business and labor, which makes sustainable economic sense. And so I'm hoping that we're going to get there. And one of the primary reasons I went into the post office is because I believed it was small enough to be a case study to prove that this triangle can work with one another. And that's my main sort of purpose there. So what we need to find, uh, I think, in South Africa, you know, generally, not just in terms of government and business, uh, is common purpose. The only time I've seen common purpose since 1994 is when we hosted the Soccer World Cup. And for however many weeks, we all forgot our differences and we put on a hell of a show, you know. But since then, we don't have common cause. You know, we have common threats right now, which I think are holding us together and driving us to decisions. And our decisions, a bit like my view of Trump, it's, you know, it's a sort of triumph of fear over hope. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that that's the dynamic that we need to change to one of being aspirational rather than, uh, you know, forced into survival discussions. This is something, if nothing else, uh, that we're the world champions at, inequality. I think we still have the Gini coefficient tables which might make us the most economically divided country in the world. Okay, now that's a problem on a number of levels, but its real consequence is that a divided and polarized population cannot appoint a cohesive government. So that if, you, if your biggest decision in the morning is whether to sprinkle parsley over your scrambled eggs and salmon, <laughs> You're not going to vote for the same leader as the guy standing in the rain to get into the outside loo. Okay. They just don't have the same agenda. And so our biggest challenge is to create a middle class uh, so that we can have a cohesive economic platform to underpin transformation. We won't have transformation without economic prosperity. The two just cannot exist one without the other. One of the biggest challenges in the world is that we need to deal with people after hours because they haven't got time to deal in hours. So, uh, for example, we had a beautiful example um, at the, uh, I may as well get it over, that mentioned the, the Bryanston Post Office, which was then substituted with the Sloan Park Post Office, which was open until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So I went to the guys and said, who do you think can come before 3? So no one was collecting their posts. It wasn't a big surprise to me. People have got jobs, you know. So you have to go to the people. And uh, we're doing that even here. Now, in India, which is a, a big economy, um, the growth in parcels business last year was about 37%. And the growth in parcel business this year to date is 117%. And the reason is kind of simple. Have you ever seen the traffic in India? So if you want to go and buy a really small item, like a sari, you don't go and buy it. You order it on the internet and you collect it at the post office. Okay. And e-commerce is one of the biggest drivers of the need for physical infrastructure. That apparent contradiction, those are hand-in-glove partners. And I'll talk to some of the reasoning that we have in how we in South Africa could do that as well. And then there's just clever people, you know. So... I don't know who came up with it in discovery to link fitness to cost of healthcare. 
but it was brilliant. Okay, so the fitter you demonstrate you are, the less you pay for your medical aid. That's pretty cool stuff as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so now you walk around and you prove or you get someone to prove on your behalf because I'm sure you can take those watches off. <laughs> give, them to your, give them to your kid to go and play rugby with him in the afternoon. You know, okay, so I don't know how they're managing that stuff. But, uh, you'll probably find some guys are much fitter than they are. But anyway, but, but, the, but, but the, the symbolic sense of again going down to the individual and moving away from the group, okay? So we, the, in the whole insurance industry, and the whole, and medical insurance is just another example, is based on group experience and costing the group experience and relying on the group experience to subsidize the tails. So you're gonna have some super fit people that live till they were, and you're gonna have some people that die too early, but actually the pricing is all to do with the, you know, the middle of the, of the bell curve, and that's how the game works. And there's sufficiently few outliers for the economics of the middle curve to swamp the consequences of the outliers, okay? And this is all common sense, which I'm sure all of you understand and know. But Discovery realized that in a competitive world, if you are not in the middle of the bell curve, you want to be treated differently. So why should you pay the medical aid rates for your neighbor who's a sloth that you see every afternoon sitting, drinking beer and smoking cigarettes, and you're out there on your bicycle, okay? So you should get a better rate. Well, they figured that out very clever. Uber is a classic example. They figured out that the experience of the customer is worth more than their custom. So whenever you get out of a, an Uber, well, in my experience, certainly, it's a bargain. That cost you 76 bucks to get home, and you're like, that was cool. I avoided this, I got that, and whatever. And it's amazing to me uh, that they see that dynamic. And one of the other dynamics is that they worked out who they are. Okay. Now, a lot of businesses don't know who they are. They just are. Okay. And so I was part of a consortium with Bought Exclusive Books. Okay. And they came to see me because nowhere could they raise money for a bookstore. And so we sat and we thought about it, but I said, it's not a bookstore. It's actually a brand that sells books. And it's one of the top 10 brands in South Africa, exclusive books. It's very trusted. What could you do? And for those of you who haven't seen it yet, go to Hyde Park and you'll find we're in the restaurant business now. And we're, in the, uh, we're engaged in you know, how do we differentiate to children and all of those kinds of things. And it's because we worked out that we were a brand, not a bookstore.